All right, um, ready? or anywhere near the strip. I think we got it ready to go. But we're starting. Here we go. All right. All right. I think we're live. We are you now, think we're live? We are now live. Let's go. All right. I'm going to hit this share button a few times. Guys, while we're sharing, get the do share going. me a favor. Hit the like button. Hit the comments. Uh, let's out see. There. Let's make sure it's uh, broadcasting here. Let's make sure. All right. It is live. All right. We are working. All right. Cool. Uh, let me share out just a couple more places. All right. Yep. Okay. We're live. Sweet. All right, Brian, would you like to start or would you like me to start, buddy? Uh, sure, I'll jump in, yeah. Uh, welcome back to another night to Get Some Fire Live with Brian and Sam. No BS. <laughs> Live Did tonight. you make that up by yourself? No, I just thought of it. Um, <laughs> with our special guest tonight, Carson Porter, fellow uh, Apex uh, brother on here. And um, he's got a huge bio over here I posted on here. Um, he does a little bit of everything. He's another car guy, which... Uh, we have in common with uh, me and Sam and uh, uh, a bunch of other stuff in common, uh, struggles and business and all kinds of other good stuff and family and kids and the whole nine. Um, so uh, let's jump in there, Carson. Tell us what you're about. What am I about? I'm about making people's lives better, well, right? That's it. That's what we do. <laughs> that's right? what we all say. That's like uh, the cliche. Everyone's like, oh, I fucking help everybody. Everybody that's should buy here, a piece right? of me. Yeah, that's why we're here. <laughs> right. No. Um... I'm just uh just a, just another dude. I like long walks on the beach. I've got some badass love handles and um Do you like you pina know, coladas? Uh yeah. pina coladas mm. too much sugar. That's a hangover yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, definitely, yeah. I'll keep it the bourbon and beer. I know <laughs> I know some people want to walk that sober line, but you know. Yeah, yeah. Hey, there's nothing wrong with the sober line. <laughs> there's yeah, yeah, yeah. Someone's gotta do it. <laughs> Better man than I am. <laughs> Thanks, dude. I just Thanks. figure eight billion people on the planet. We can't all be sober all the time. Yeah. <laughs> so, right. my, yeah, but why do I got to do it? Why, why do you got to do it? Job? <laughs> just God's plan for you, man. That's it. That's it. I didn't. I didn't get a say in that. <laughs> <laughs> At some point, you made a choice. At some point, you made a choice. Nah, you're right. You're right. You're right. Yeah. So, Carson, what are you doing on what are you doing on our podcast, mate? Because I looked through your bio and you've done just about like everything man um let's go back in time a little bit to um it, it says here you you are one of uh seven kids um that's almost as many as i got i took it's brian i was gonna say my mom and daddy got busy but like do you have more kids no i got six okay i got six not quite as busy as the old, <laughs> the old we haven't quite, quite figured out the economics of contraception have we brian no no <laughs> No, no. Uh, but it, say, it says here you start. <laughs> it says here you started your first business at thirteen. Yeah, knocking on doors to change oil on people's dirt bikes it. and fix their lawnmowers. That's yeah. very, very similar to what I used to do. Um, I've done a lot of fixing mowers and fixing bicycles, that kind of stuff for people. Dude, how does a thirteen-year-old even figure that out? Tell us a little bit about your journey as uh, as an entrepreneur. So, I mean, growing up, um, I've got a little bit of an empath. I've got a lot of asshole in me and a little bit of an empath in me. And it's just enough that growing up, you know, I came up and very early in life, you have end of the 80s, Black Friday, 1989, right? Early 90s, shit's hitting the fan. Then you've got dot-com burst. And then you've got the housing market crisis in 08. And, and my whole upbringing there's just this constant narrative from the adults, from the people I'm supposed to look up to in my life. Of, <laughs> Holy fuck, yeah. there's no opportunity. I can't make a paycheck. Mm -hmm. I've, I've got to beg and borrow to just to get by. And, and I don't know why it just ate at me. I could go into a, a long narrative about this. I'll, I'll spare you the details, though. But um, but just ate away at me. It always, for some reason, bugged me. It's not It's not that life is about money, but it certainly takes money to live life, right? That's the truth. Yep. And um, so, yeah, I, I wanted shit. I grew up in the Southwest where all my friends had dirt bikes and, and four wheelers and doing all this fun stuff. I played baseball, wanted to do baseball camps and, and all these things. My parents, phenomenal people. They wanted to support me and all that, but financially just kind of wasn't there a lot of times. 
And, um, and so I had to figure out how was I going to go to baseball camp? You know, how was I going to go let uh, Greg Maddox teach me how to throw a knuckleball? How was I going to, you know, get that dirt bike that I wanted to ride? My first dirt bike was a 92 Kawasaki KX 125. And, you know, how was I going to not only earn that, but how was I going to earn the ungodly amounts of money it was going to cost to, you know, put new clutch plates in it And um, <laughs> to a 13 year old, that was a mountain, right? Yeah. Yeah. No um, doubt. And so that's what I knew, you know, was, was fixing weed eaters and lawnmowers and, uh, and dirt bikes and ATVs. Cause that's the business that, uh, my old man does kind of came up in it, went from sweeping floors and crushing oil filters to, um, you know, changing oil and then doing breaks. And, and it's, it's like a, sweeping floors is the, you know, it's, it's, it's the entry level for yes, everything. That's, yes. that's where I start. It's I can remember being like, they're like five and six years old. I'd sweep all the floors up on job sites for my dad. Yeah. I'd Same sweep thing. them up. Get every, I, yeah, but then he'd go and he'd take the bag and he'd dump it out again. He's like, there you go. That'll keep you busy. Get some more practice. <laughs> Well, fuck. My old man didn't have to do that. He ran his shop (laughs) instead of using. um, I tried when when him and I at one point owned the shop together, and um, I tried to get him on. Hey, you know, let's use mops and buckets. Let's use a solvent. We'll mop this floor. It's gonna be nice and clean. But he just swears by that. uh, You know, the floor dry you dump on a speedy dry the kitty litter. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So he lived and died by that shit. So he didn't have (laughs) to dump it back out. There was always plenty more to sweep up. Yeah. Well, they say in the, the apex measuring stuff is, uh, you know, how you do one thing is how you do everything. And it was my job as a kid to clean the job sites, like to sweep them up. Like every day at the end of the day, we would leave the job site cleaner than we found it. And then at the end of it, when all the work was done, I even remember I was probably 10 or 11 years old. My dad bought a carpet shampooing machine so we could go back through the house and just clean up all the carpets and make sure they uh, they couldn't tell that the painters had been. So uh, that was drilled into me early on. Um, sweeping up, super important. I, I still like to do it. I don't do it as much anymore. Like, I think I feel like there's a big lesson in that, though, Sam. There's, oh, absolutely. If you, can't, if you can't handle the basics of cleaning up the mess, what the fuck makes you think you deserve to – well, it, that's in the first place. It drives me mad now because I sit in the I sit in the chair of the guy that buys the house and says, "Right, fellas, knock this shit out and let's get this one flipped and everything else." And you know, you can rock up on a job site at, at six o'clock at night to to check everything's going on and walk in. The place is a disaster. Yep. And even on construction sites, growing up, this site was clean and put up before you left for the day. And now, shit, like they'll just be they'll yeah. be. There'll be tools and just like like yeah. guys don't even put their tools away at night and they come back in the morning. Oh, the my tools are gone. It's, it's wrong with, you like, put them away. Just shit, yeah. shit everywhere. It's crazy. Just yeah. offcuts, pieces of wood. Yeah. They haven't swept. Drink, drink bottles will drive yeah. me up the wall. You'll find drink bottles all over job yeah. sites. I'm like, can you not put that in the bin? It's insane. So, the first, I, I, I would <laughs> consider a high net worth client I ever had when I got into like insurance and finance was a solopreneur, worked for himself, had you know one or two other little helpers, but that was it. His whole business was running around cleaning up construction sites. That's it. That's all he did. Picking up water bottles and nails and because kind of the contractors wouldn't hold their people accountable to keep it a good, clean job site. And I mean, dude was worth millions of dollars from cleaning up job sites. That's it. Well, well I feel now if, if, if you could come out and, and, and set a super high standard for accountability in the contracting space, you make a fortune. Um, I think maybe because um, there's such a shortage of guys that they don't have to care. And it, it bothers me. It's, it's difficult because when I try to hire people and bring them into, into my crews, I want, it to, I want it to look right. I want it to be done right. And I just, I'd rather not. I'd rather go slower and have the guys on there doing it right rather than try to speed up and have guys trash all the shit. Why is there such a shortage of, of people? And this is any industry. This is something that's been on my mind. Why is there such a shortage? There's so many jobs. People are screaming about needing money. Even when Uncle Sam was printing the bills, which I think they're getting ready to wrap up the ticket on that. But um, <laughs> some of the things the Fed put out there lately, we'll see. It's kind of reminiscent um, of like yeah. 2013 when they were talking about tapering off the, the quantitative easing. And um, then we saw the stock market drop, and so they decided. I mean, how deep? How deep do you want to go in this? I, I mean, that, that could go deep. Yeah, I think it's probably one of the biggest issues people face today, especially business owners. Why can't you find good help? You're offering good money. Well, Why don't people? It want was to always work? frowned upon to uh, be in a in a trade. It was uh, go get your uh, college degree, and uh, you yeah, know, the trades are frowned upon. Yeah. You know, get your degree in underwater fire prevention, and uh, you know, try and make a living. And meanwhile, the uh, you like that, right? Um, 
yeah, a union. So I'm in New York City. Um, our job sites, uh, there's actually laborers union that clean the job sites. Um, it's part of what they do. Like you don't clean up your own mess. Like our trade, we, we demo duck work, we throw it on the floor and they take it away. Uh, we don't have to clean up our mess. So it's, it's actually kind That's of crazy. Thing. Yeah. So we're actually really not allowed to clean up our own mess. Like basically we make a mess, we throw it on the floor and they come and clean it up. But, um, I tell you what, I tell you where everybody's gone. Um, it's an opinion. It's not a fact. But did we ever stop to think about that in March of 2020, everybody got sent home? And a lot of people got told that, hey, you're non-essential, sit at the fucking house. You're non-essential. Sorry, yeah. we don't need you. So if I'm sitting at the house, right, and my non-essential fucking job pays me $2 an hour plus tips, and I'm non-essential, and I back that out and shit, I make 80 bucks a day or a hundred bucks a day waiting tables. And then I've got all this time at home. And after the first three weeks of, uh, in Thomas Keenan's favorite famous words, you know, laying on the couch, drinking Corona and eating sleeves of Oreos. Well, we Oreos all did that, and Corona's right? though. That's kind of gross, but just... yeah. Oreos and milk, man. Yeah, Corona milk. and lime. Yeah. Oreo and milk. Exactly. Um, but, <laughs> like, Do you eat with a Corona? Is that actually acceptable? I, I, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Like, who drinks Corona? Any? I'm getting sidetracked. <laughs> so we, we we sent all these fucking people to sit at the house. Right, go sit at the house. You're non-essential. And then they're left with solving a problem of how do I generate a hundred dollars a day? Because that's what my that's what I'm bringing home as a waiter or a waitress. I, I, again, I'm using round numbers. But the problem they got to hit is how do I generate a hundred bucks a day? And that's with everybody. Everybody in those non-essential jobs is now faced with, I'm sitting at the house, I have to generate X dollars a day to live, how do I do it? And they've never been in that situation before. And people turn to the gig economy. And I know so many people right now that don't have jobs, they just fucking do shit. Plus you got unemployment, um, so you don't really need to make what you're making, you need to just well, supplement your unemployment. Most, most of the people I know didn't even get unemployment. Um, they just said, this isn't working for me, and they went a different way. Um, I know waitresses that make stable 20 to $25 an hour driving Uber and driving, um, what's it? The food one, yeah, right? Eats and whatnot, yeah. I've got buddies that have degrees that now sit at the bar all day, um, going back and forth, getting jobs, doing handyman work, odd jobs, working on cars, cleaning up, power washing, trimming trees, yard work, just like. People have gone into this like gig economy yeah, where yeah. nobody nobody fucking owns them, and maybe one spouse will have benefits, but the other one won't support the other, or maybe nobody's got benefits. And then you start looking at health insurance, and it's you know it's fucking twelve grand a year, fifteen grand a year um, to it's buy stuff. Twenty six thousand like, a year, right? Well, twenty six thousand for family plan. Just don't get sick, man. Yeah, man. You know, this, this like, what's the point? What's the incentive of going to work for two dollars an hour as a waitress? Or what's the incentive to go to work for nine dollars an hour, starting out in a in a trade? Or what's the incentive to go work for fifteen dollars an hour? There's no fucking incentive because fifteen dollars an hour times eight after taxes is still a hundred bucks a day. Yeah. All I got to do to make a hundred bucks a day is find one thing I can sell ten times on the internet for ten bucks profit. Yeah, that's it. That's where everybody's gone. Because fuck you, I'm not waiting tables for $2 an hour. Yeah. So what's the solution, right? Do we just do away with restaurants and construction businesses and the trades and everything in between? Or what's what's an ad, what's a viable solution? It's a serious problem. Yeah, it's a serious problem. I, I, I don't know. Unless, <laughs> like, you wanna, unless you want to pay a ton for you. You want to pay the waiters and waitresses but, a ton of money. And, I, don't, I, don't know the, I don't know the solution. Yeah. But that's what, in my mind, that's where the problem is. The problem is people have figured out that they can use the internet to completely level the playing field mm -hmm. and put money in their pockets. Um, Venmo and Cash App and Uber and Favor and all these little fucking delivery things, yeah. people are making more money than they are at jobs. I don't know the solution, but that's what I see. I, I may be wrong. I've been wrong plenty of times before. But it, on the lower income level that my friends, the guys at the bar, the people that I see out and about, they're all just hooking it up with odd jobs and, and gigs. Every single one of them. You ever follow uh, Mike Rowe, the Dirty Jobs guy? 
Oh yeah, and yeah. he's got he's got basically a scholarship to put people through the trades, which is mm-hmm. what needs to be preached. I mean, being in a trade was always like considered taboo, and now you know, oh, you said go get your degree and whatever that you can't use that you're making you know twenty thirty grand a year after you spent hundreds of thousands of dollars in college, or go be in a trade and and earn money the rest of your life. This you know the <laughs> the, the starting salary, especially if you get in a union trade, I mean they make stupid money. You know. Well, I don't know how how to address it. But I did read an interesting uh, article today about the wage gap between the workers and the CEOs and how that gap has increased hundreds and hundreds of percent um, over the last 50 years. And I wonder if it's got something to do with that. I wonder if companies aren't geared towards too much profit for the shareholders and the CEOs. And we've been conditioned for the longest time to pay people enough just so they'll be happy enough to just not leave. Whereas all of us guys, we learn to build our businesses on people and around people and on people's goals, on people's dreams, and on helping our people to become the best versions of ourselves. Most businesses don't run like that. Most businesses look at you as a spreadsheet and say, how can we, how can we, you know, balance these hours out don't go over 35 hours you know they're not even want to give people full-time work because of fucking health insurance stuff i mean how much money is going to the shareholders and the ceos that could be given more incentive to employees i like that. I, I don't know i'm i'm on the ceo side i like the profit i like the shareholders i like that however I like the ownership, though. It's, like, like in yeah, EXP, where you give people, a stock, you know, you, you, now you have ownership in the company. You kind of look at it a little differently. But if the people that work for you don't have any way to achieve their goals and their dreams whilst working for you, then why the fuck should they work for you? No, sure. Like, yeah, you're going to have $10 an hour kids that all they can do is wash dishes, but it's your job to mentor them and help them grow and either evolve them into a position in your company that's further along for them or help them to grow and help them to move on in life. You can't fucking keep people forever as a $10 an hour dishwashing robot. That's not their part dream. The, that's part of the problem, right? So it, it's such a macro problem. So if you take um, just kind of two points real quick. Okay. If you take the fact that so since 2015, we've printed more money in the United States than we've printed in all previous years combined. We've printed I more think- money. I think right. 40% of these dollars that are in existence have come since 2020. It's crazy. It, it, like it's 40% insane. of the shit. It's, it's, crazy. it's crazy. It's insane. So if you look at our national debt, our national debt was hovering around like $25 trillion, I think, kind of beginning a coronavirus era. We're currently, I, th- I think we're approaching $29 trillion. The good news is liabilities were approaching $160 trillion. Insane. None of that actually exists. It doesn't. It, it's It's numbers on paper, but it's... It's the Fed printing money, right? Which the Fed is not federal. The Fed is private. So right, money yes. gets printed, gets injected into banks. And but how few people actually know that? How few people know that the Fed is a privately held company? Very few people. I feel like there's just not the, a lot right. of education on it, right? Well, well why would you educate? Like, if, yeah. if I own the education system, why would I tell the kids in the education system about how the finance system works? I sure as shit wouldn't. You wouldn't. You wouldn't. And I no, think here's not the problem at all. now. It goes to the banks. And we're not just talking like the, the Wells Fargo's of the world where you have a checking account, right? We're talking the investment banks and the shadow banks. We're talking like BlackRock, Goldman, Morgan Stanley, mm-hmm. the asset managers, right? Vanguard. So Vanguard is, a, is another yeah. huge one. So they currently own over 30% of every dollar printed since 2015 is held at mm-hmm. those bank levels. Interest rates are suppressed really, really low to try and get them to loan out, but they're not loaning out. What are they using that money for? They're buying up assets that uh, typically Americans would own, like homes. That's why we've seen this Mm -hmm. massive inflation of values because you see a a sharp drop in inventory, right? It's not because builders aren't building. It's because these guys are buying it faster than you can build it, right? Um, And then You'll own nothing and you'll be happy. Right. And then the other thing they're investing in is – artificial intelligence they're looking to replace jobs i think over the next five ten years we'll see millions and millions of jobs lost to artificial intelligence no doubt because your firms are are they're investing in the fact that they don't need janine being nice to you to hand you a fucking plate of food a a robotic arm can hand you a plate of food and it's not ever going to talk back it's never going to call in sick every place now you know mcdonald's you know you have these ordering machines it's never going to call me sweetheart and ask if i want to freshen my coffee and ask how my day was either 
You There's can't a lot of human. But but in 2021, Janine, you're Janine has in anyways. DoorDash Janine, has proved that. Dude, Janine has intrinsic value to a business though. And if if my business model is DoorDash, at what point do I just set up a kitchen with a window and start yep. slinging cars? Now, if if you want a dining experience, you need your Janines. Yes. I think you need your genius. But if you want a profitable food business model, look at fucking food trucks and how they've exploded in the yeah. last two years. How how amazing the food truck industry is doing. Yeah. Again, it's it's a model where there's there's no tables, there's no wait staff. It's we're making food, we're making a profit, and we, we go location to location. Like yeah. I think and, my yeah, my point was just simply that I think corporate America has lost its benevolence. Mm -hmm. It's not about did it ever have any? It used to be about in the fifties. It was about hey, go get an education, come in at the bottom, sweep the damn floors, work your way up, yeah. rise you through the ranks. There is zero fucking benevolence anymore. It's hey, we're going to suppress your income so we can reinvest those dollars into a machine that's going to replace you because we think we can get the same marginal profit, the same profit margin yeah. with yeah. less headache. We're not going to make more, but we're going to have less headache. Nobody's going to bitch about us going and spending, you know, millions and millions of dollars on our own yacht uh -huh. or whatever. And, and by the way, by the way, you're non-essential and take this fucking vaccine or you can't have a job. Yeah. Yeah. yeah corporate America. That's it. They've lost the plot, though. Um, the, the lack of labor and the minimum wage getting raised and all that other stuff has led to more of this automation and you know these machines that you take your order at mcdonald's now and you go up to the thing and you punch your thing in and you apple pay and uh that cashier that you used to have that they're no longer there anymore because was that there to save money or is that that all started when they raised minimum wage up to 15 dollars an hour and he said hey you know what you're not going to tell us that we got to pay you know entry-level cashiers 15 dollars an hour we're going to put a machine in their place now we don't have to pay them anything and you know so it's chicken or the egg what where that came from and then once you once it's gone, it never comes back. You know, once an elevator stopped uh, in, the, in the city, you still have the elevators that are manual that you got to, you know, basically have an up and down switch and a guy runs them mm -hmm. in some of the older buildings. And then the new ones come in and you push buttons. That elevator guy's gone. You don't need him anymore. There's a button that does it. You know, so the, that stuff mm -hmm. keeps going on. But again, it's part of it's technology's cheaper, but part of it's also now we can't get the labor, so we have to use technology. You know, it's, but then uh, is technology what's pushing the debate for universal basic income? That's a whole nother. I mean, I just, well, just, shit, we, we've opened one can. We might as well <laughs> open the can next to it. Just let all the worms out onto the table. Yeah, um, universal because, income. Well, when you look at a country and look at a nation and look at the nation's assets, the dollar is supposedly backed by the faith and credit of the U.S. government, which is all of the assets that are cumulatively owned by all the people in the country, you would think. So if we've got all of these assets... Where are the profits going from people that get to explore on government land and people that get to harvest government uh, properties from leases? And, and there's so many different parts to this equation. Whereas as a society, do we now have a duty to society itself? Looking back, because I'm 41, Brian's mid-40s, you're probably, a, you, you, well, you said you grew up in the 80s, you're probably right around there. Yeah, um, early 30s, mid 30s. Yeah. What, what, what are we giving to the people that are coming behind us? What are we giving to our kids? What are we leaving for our grandkids? And let's let's leave universal basic income alone for just half a second, and let's look at education and healthcare. We have enough money as a country to completely pay for any kind of education we want for any of our citizens, and we have enough money to pay for free healthcare. Everybody, not whether we should or not, but we're already being taxed at a rate that would support that because we spent almost enough to pay for education and healthcare on the last 20 years in Afghanistan. But then again, if I say that out loud, I get shut down. I get in trouble for that. Well, that's socialist. Well, hey, we've got to be a little bit socialist, a lot capitalist, just a, a sprinkling of socialism to help the people that fall through the cracks. But like, we've got enough without changing any kind of even without changing the taxes just by spending the money differently yeah, we could completely revolutionize further and higher education by removing it from the universities now and making it open source online which everybody's doing and yet i'm still hearing high school kids going hundreds of thousands of dollars into debt as they go to college to get the degree that they've been promised will give them all this amazing shit 
Whereas really you can get a better level of education right now from Udemy, from Khan Academy, from YouTube. Why are we not making this open source and helping our kids and giving them the education they need? Why are we handcuffing kids to hundreds of thousands of dollars in university debt? I mean, of course, the college is going through the roof like insane. Like the, the, but why? Yeah, why? Exactly. I mean, the, why? The, I know the information. Yeah. It's like, it still costs this much to print a book. Yeah, I get yeah. it. I know there's, there's research. There's all kinds of shit goes yeah, on in universities. Yeah. I know universities have a function. I, I do. I'm not suggesting why, we eradicate why, universities yeah. for a second. 50, Who's 60 grand a year for to get uh, a degree there's a in way to, something that's going to make you 50 grand a year? I mean, that doesn't make any there's sense There's a way to do this. There's a way for us to come out and say, look, this is a new this is a new and improved education system like and we can do it all with the money that we already already like we could do it with way less money we could be more efficient if it was in the hands of private business and it's not in the hands of government yeah i think when you quit listening to what the fuck people are saying whether it's in washington or it's kind of at the top of the pyramid or, or wherever when you quit listening to what they're saying and start watching what they're doing mm -hmm. it's very clear to see Right. That there is no benevolence anymore. And a lot of people are like, oh, it's a money game. Follow the money. Eh, okay, maybe. I think it's more about control, frankly. Mm -hmm. Oh, totally. I yeah, think it's more about control. Why don't you empower? Why would you not empower your youth? Because you want your youth to act a certain fucking way. And debt, debt is the number one controlling financial instrument in the world. That's why bonds are the number one bought and sold asset in the world. Hey, man, that's why, yeah. you, can't, that's why you can't bankruptcy student loans. You, They're those handcuffs right there. Yep. You can't. So, so debt is a wonderful. If your if your goal is to control people, control the way they act, the way they think, what they're gonna do when they wake up in the morning, and what mm -hmm. they're thinking about when they go to bed at night, you control the debt, right? Yeah, just enslave them. That's it. That's yeah. it. Give them free shit. They vote for you, and uh, you win forever. <laughs> Right, you give them just enough to vote for you, so you continue to have the control, and you continue to make yeah. the policies, and you continue to do the things you want to do, and push the narrative you want to push. Yeah, that's so Why would you empower somebody to to get out of that? You you yeah. frankly wouldn't, uh, unless your goal was benevolence. But I think that's where, I think that's you know obviously Trump's controversial, but I think that was a lot of his popularity. He was he was you know a little outside the the norm, outside the system, and he shook things up. And and basically, I uh, said, why are we spending money here? Why are we doing this stupidness? You know, I started running government like a business, which it really is. Money comes in, money goes out. You have budgets to meet. You know, it, it, what business in the world budgets upside down every year and keeps you know keeps going? You know, if if, no. if the U.S. government was a business, they'd be bankrupt. You know, hundred years ago. So, <laughs> you know, right? So Trump yeah. comes in and says, hey, this is a business here. Let's run it like a business. Let's stop wasting money. Let's start making some smart decisions. Could you and imagine though? Could you imagine how incredible it would be, right, to run a business and just be running out of money? Right. Like, hey, yeah. fuck it. Brian, go go to the photocopier, mate. Just run off a yeah. few grand yeah. in hundreds real quick. But, but, but that's, all, that's all the government's doing. Yeah. Or raise taxes and, and make everyone pay more. Like, so yeah. let's no, raise our prices. Taxes, yeah. They're not even raising fucking so taxes. So let's go they're back to go universal basic income and money and yes. printing money again, right? So yes. Yes. quantitative easing. This is That's the yes. formal name for... For our inflation, money. forced inflation, whatever, yeah. Inflation right? Right. yeah. Uh, the bailouts, okay, is quantitative yeah. easing. What is quantitative easing? We print money, right? And when we print money, once we pass a certain threshold, now we, we move into inflate, we inflate our market and then we move into hyperinflation. Yeah. But at the same time with quantitative easing, we do something else. We suppress bond rates and we keep bond rates really, really low to incentivize mm -hmm. people to borrow that money and then we rely on a private controller the banks who actually lend the money out that's been given to them right mm -hmm. well this is a it's a bankrupt system like you said it, it should have been bankrupt a long time ago but yeah. every every other week they're raising the debt ceiling no we can continue to function on more yeah. debt and more debt, so more they got debt. a new credit card you know i just got a new credit card offer in a mail it's right it's, it's, it's all bullshit. transfer it's to all, balance you know it's really all they're um, doing. is it yeah. wolf of wall yeah. street yeah i think it's wolf of wall street where um What's the dude's name? My wife is super into him. If he was ever into her, I'd be in trouble. Um, <laughs> uh, plays in Lincoln. Oh, player. Jonah Hill. Not Jonah Hill. Um, the other dude. I can't remember. I'll remember it at some point. But um, no, he's talking about how it's all just pie in the sky, right? They're all yeah. just bullshit numbers. That, that's all it is. But it crashes the system. So we're at this point now where we've printed as much as we can print before we hit hyperinflation. We've also suppressed bond rates and, and suppressed interest rates down to almost zero. 
So once you hit zero, the only thing you can do is go negative to continue this same pattern or the same trend, right? Um, which completely collapses the financial marketplace as we know it. Because if you've got to pay to put your money in the bank, are you going to put your money in the bank? No, you're not, right? So put it in my have, sock. Right. <laughs> So, yeah. so you have to ask, okay, well, why would we collapse our money marketplace? Well, if we collapse our money marketplace and we can move on to a single digital currency issued by a federal government who can control us. And, and uh, this is where universal basic income comes from, right? You're going to get a deposit from one bank account. And not only from that bank account, will you be able to uh, have this income come in, but we can control where you spend it, how you spend mm -hmm. it, how much can you spend on toiletries versus how much can you spend on housing? I we, think that's going to push a black market. I still think it, it'll create a black market, but I still think it's a control play. It's not. Oh, a, absolutely. No, it's control. It's all about how control. many more fucking Costco hot dogs can you buy when you're 60, 100 million dollars rich, a billion dollars rich? At some point, you don't give a shit about money anymore. It's control. Right. It's an absolute. It's absolutely that's what universal play. basic income is about, in my opinion. And I think you look at what I'd be inclined on. to agree with that. Yeah, I, think I, yeah, I could when agree you look with at that. what's going on. A lot of it is control play. Why wouldn't you crash the market? Yeah, it hurts people, but it gives you control. Mm -hmm. Beg for um, mercy and yeah. uh, start worshiping. Call me a conspiracy yeah. theorist, but. No, it's, it's, well, it's no, because the, the difference between a conspiracy and reality is about six months. So, <laughs> no, you, you're bang on point. I mean, it, it, you know, do, you tie in, um, do you tie in the vaccine and the vaccine passports to what is becoming increasingly likely to be in a social credit score and if your social credit score is tied into your digital currency which is tied into your character in zuckerberg's new metaverse just yeah, how exactly. much how much free thinking are you going to be capable of if you've got a social credit score that won't let you do shit if you don't comply you've got 100 percent digital currency that won't let you buy sell or trade if you don't comply like this is beginning to sound like like the fucking can't participate in society unless you take this mark of this beast and now that is conspiracy theorist i don't want to go down that route but when you look at how the new metaverse is going to tie into a social credit score which is going to tie into online digital currency which is going to tie into online real estate like which already exists but is going to just explode people are going to really start to get the idea of, of what it is to hold assets in a digital space in a virtual world right like where does the free man come into this because it seems very much as though we're being pushed down this little funnel Scary. and then boom you're an automaton and that's it and i think we're going to see a bunch of guys especially like me, I plan to be a part of this social credit fucking online currency universe. I plan to be a part of it. I bet it's going to be great. But I also plan to keep some silver and keep some tradable, tangible assets that I can use outside of a system that wants... I mean, the, the amount they already know, the amount the system already knows about us is, is staggering anyway. Right. But, man, I just like a little cash, you know? I, I like to reach in my pocket, pull out two bucks for a coffee and not have my banker know that I spent two bucks, you know? Yeah, they don't want that anymore. I, you, know, you get, you get I, charged to put cash in a bank. If you want to make a cash deposit, they charge you. It's, it's I'll tell you what I heard on the airplane coming in today. Yeah. Um, they said, for your safety, for your fucking safety, for your safety, we no longer accept cash payments or card payments. You have to download the United app, upload your card to the app, and then order what you want through the app and pay through the app. Now, how in the fuck is that keeping me safe? <laughs> Sounds good. No, it's not for my safety at all. It's control. It's control. Let's be honest. It for company policy, their online real estate. Right. We want to collect your data. Yeah. We want we you want to use data, our platform. So yeah, use our platform. So and we we're not data. going. Yeah. We're not going to accept legal currency or legal cards. Yeah. You have to use through our platform. It's acceptable like, in the name of safety. And but COVID it was and sold to us yep. to keep us safe. Like, Sam, give, count your blessings, dude. Give it six more months, and they're going to ask you to shit in a shoebox for a for a coke on a flight. <laughs> Mark my words, it's coming. <laughs> it's coming. They're going to want. Sorry for the guy next to me. <laughs> they're going to want a like, sample, dude. It's coming, and and United, you know, is going to be the one that asks for it first. So, like, I'm on a metal. Yeah. 
fucking tube at 550 miles an hour at 40,000 feet. Like, <laughs> I'm going to hand you cash. I don't give a fuck about safety. I got on this tube. You know, like, let, let's be realistic here. Well, I like, think they, they're blaming it on COVID. You might be passing germs, and that's why it's not safe. You know, yes, all, I'm on an airplane. COVID. It all comes back to the COVID game. Did, they didn't sanitize the magazine in the seat in front of me. Like, they hadn't even vacuumed the airplane yep. when we got off and they started boarding the people back to Houston. Like, the flight I was on was full. It was at the, the ones before had been canceled. There were people everywhere at the airport. And they didn't, like, so you can't tell me this is about safety. No, they I didn't. Think they it's just control. shoveled everyone back on it. It's, it's all control. control. It's, I'm sure you've read these books, but it's entirely reminiscent to me of Fahrenheit 451, Atlas Shrugged, and every bad episode of Black Mirror that you've ever watched. Black Mirror's turned into a fucking documentary. <laughs> I swear. Yeah. Just saying, there, I remember there was this uh, Black Mirror episode, this was a couple years ago, on social credit, and you'd point your phone at somebody yeah. in their life, and, and that's thumbs up. going on right now. I think eventually you get to a point where you have um, a bunch of people that uh, are absolutely uneducated because their access to information is limited. And you have other people who are educated and just say, you know what? You want what I have? Fine. Fuck it. Who is John Galt? And I'm off. Let me abscond in the wilderness. We're we're always going to have uneducated people. I mean, you know, we've had that for just through entirety of human history. Um, But I think we are going to see uh, a division here to where a lot of people are just like, no, fuck it. We'll go start our own thing. We're going to go do our own thing. You'll leave us alone. Yeah, well, um, it's a revolution when, on our hands. When I, I've started seeing some of the videos coming out of New York and I saw all the police officers lined up today, getting ready to not go back to work tomorrow. Um, they, they say 27, 28% of the public service workers in New York, I don't know if you know that number or not, Brian, are uh, unvaccinated and are fixing to walk out. And, you know, we've had it drilled into us. Support your police, support your firefighters. So guess what? That's what we'll do, I guess. You know? Um, it just, it's and nice to see some people saying... to be anyway. I mean, New York right now, I mean, it's, you know, there's people shitting on the sidewalk, you know, shooting heroin on the sidewalk. I mean, it's... it's- you know, it's and it's OK. Well, and you know what? Because of this thing where everyone hates the cops and everyone's setting the cops up and filming the cops, the cops are like, hey, listen, I'm not risking my pension. You want to poop on a sidewalk and you want to shoot heroin? And as long as you're not hurting anyone, who cares? Kill yourself, you know. And that's all the cops that I know are kind of like, hey, listen, listen, you don't want me to do my job. You want to defund the police? I got five more years till I get my pension. I'm going to go hide in the corner and uh, I'm going to stay out of trouble. And uh, you know, why would I go stick my neck out where it used to be? You know, you actually physically cared about the job. You cared about keeping people safe. Now, when you're the enemy, these guys are all just hiding and, and trying to count the days so they can retire and get their pension. It's, it's, it's a serious problem that's going on in the world right now. I don't blame it. It, it reminds me of that one movie. Uh, with the, it was Ben Affleck was in it. and they, they were robbing a bank and they were all dressed as nuns. And they, they ran away. They got out of the getaway car. They were carrying their assault rifles and their cash. And they, they ran across an old cop. <laughs> and he was looking at them out of the car and they all froze. And, he just rolled up the window and drove away. Yeah. <laughs> you know, he's close to retirement. Yeah, yeah. I get involved. But yeah. then, you know, like I've I've had COVID um, and I got better and it lasted a couple of days. And I did the conspiracy theorist fucking thing and I took all the vitamins and all the Z packs and all the ivermectin, you know, call it what you want. But it, I, I was down for two days. And now science shows that I'm carrying all these fucking wonderful natural antibodies that are stronger than anything that a vaccine can provide me. So I'm so confused as to why we're still pushing a mandate on something that we have Control. by science now, yeah. by science, we've achieved herd immunity. Yeah. I think it's, you got to quit overcomplicating it. It's control. It's control. Simple as that. One word. It's nothing else. It's, Fucking control. You're on the airplane, you got to wear your uh, mask, but you can take it off while you're drinking, uh, you know, your water, and you know, but then you got to put it back on. We don't drink water, but then you take it off again when you eat your pretzels, and you got to put it back on. It's like either you I wear just it, left, or you don't got to wear it. I mean, like I left, I left the water on the table, yeah, like that, and I put the mask next to the water. I left the top of the water. I was like, whatever. Like I'm sitting, like I was like this, like yeah. I, because and we got in the middle row again. The flight was just crazy bird on the uh and, on the entranceway it says keep six feet apart and there's like marks on the wall and stuff and i'm like um, yeah 
six feet like, apart on the way into the plane, but we're going to sit next to each other for three we hours. We touch. We touched the same armrests. Yeah, you know, same, my yeah, my legs good. were touching the legs of the guys on the side of me. You know, if 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 there was COVID on that plane, we would all have it. But again, I've had it. Like yeah, so, so we talk it, about it. You know, you got the flu. The flu kills people every year. If you got a weakened immune system, you know, you got to be careful of any. Well, you know, disease, what's you know? gonna happen? What's gonna happen this year? Because everybody's got fucking weakened immune systems now yeah. from staying inside the whole time. Yeah. I don't know. Let's, just let's, this podcast. let's talk about some good stuff. What are we gonna talk yeah, about? Yeah, let's talk about some great stuff. We're in Vegas. About... Why aren't you in Vegas, Brian? I should like be in Vegas, me and Car- me I've and Carson are in Vegas. I've been Look, in Vegas I've... in shit for 15, 20 years, something like that. I was trying to get the authentic Vegas view out the window, but the lights from my room are reflecting back in. I don't know how to fix it, so ah, sorry. But I am actually in a hotel. Look, so we can show sitting outside, and there's the strip is out there, but I'm not sure if you can see it or not. It's Treasure Island, so I'm at the top end of the strip. Nice. Cool. Um, right. Treasure stayed, Island's always a good party spot any night of the week. I stayed there one night. I stayed at Venetian one night when I was there. I've been there twice. I have. I wouldn't know what to do if I if I happened upon a party i'd probably just sidle quite quietly to the side and then leave um just order the tacos get a churro put a smile on hang out at, at treasure island last time i was there i was there for a uh, trade show for a um like uh, uh they sold stock photography for advertising so it was my friend's company and uh he's like yeah well, we got a suite at the venetian jump on a plane and come hang out with me you know for three days whatever like that I'm like, all right that sounds cool so uh, I went down there and I was actually in the booth selling the product for them. I had no idea what it was, but I was bored. So, you know, what we do. So uh, his boss thought it was entertaining that I was selling a product and he didn't know who I was. You know, it was just, I was just talking to people walking by, like, you need this. I'm like, what? I don't have these pictures. You need them. You know, it was, it was kind of fun. And uh, we had a blast. And uh, the one night we decided, oh, what are we going to do tonight? I don't know. So this girl's holding a sign that says like MC squared or something like that. And like, uh, what's the sign mean? And they're like, oh, that's for the after party. We're like, oh, yeah. She goes, yeah, limo's waiting outside. And we're like, all right. She goes, did you leave your tickets in the room? And we're like, yes, we did. She's like, all right, go see. <laughs> She's like, go see Lauren Jennifer over there. She's got it's extra It's like tickets. they had something planned for yeah, you. Yeah, it was great. It? So now we're like, all right. So she goes, hey, hey, Lauren, you have tickets? We left ours in the room. She goes, oh, yeah, I got some extras. Here you go. And I'm like, all right. She's like, limo's outside. So we go jump in a limo. We're like, wonder where we're going. And across town, go into this bar and music's going, live band going. And Walk up to the bar, order some drinks, give the guy 20 bucks. He gives me, you know, 10 and five and five singles back. And I go, ooh, open bar. All right, well, this works. And full food, spread of food and everything. It was a corporate party for someone at the event. And we crashed it and we had a blast. And yeah, hung I was going to say, you had like a 99 out of out of 100% chance of, of heading to a strip club where they were going to beat you down for $100 or yeah, something. Yeah, it was, just, it was a corporate party. Yeah, it was fun. It was like, we were getting in this car going, I wonder where we're going tonight. This is going to be fun. <laughs> Oh man! You're the only guy in the history of the internet that got in a car with a stranger and good shit happens to. Yeah, right. I was gonna say 100 percent of the time, seven days a week, that limo heads on down to Little Darlings or something else like that. You know, well, it was actually funny. So, the two- I'm just gonna write that down real quick. Heads where? <laughs> right. <laughs> right, 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 right. You wouldn't know what to do with a party, Sam. <laughs> you are quite correct. No, I wouldn't. Because, um, because it's funny because like. I don't. Um, I do have one for sale, though. If you know anyone looking for a church, I've got one. Um, it's a good church. It's, uh, it's, it's quite nice. Um, <laughs> dude, like, I partied so much as a kid. Um, like, you just... You, it, it, it would be so difficult to walk into a room and be like old Sam without alcohol. I think that guy's gone. Uh, I, don't, I don't know that I would ever go to... Like, dude, holy shit. Like, the parties we went to... Uh, industry parties, advertising industry stuff, the celebrities, the money, the like. My, my guys would spend twenty, thirty thousand dollars just on bottle service. They'd rent the whole fucking club out just so they could smoke weed before weed was legal. Um, and like, I just couldn't. I couldn't even imagine. Like, my life has changed so much. I couldn't even imagine myself in the scenario of, of walking into a nightclub. With drinks and drugs, it just it's I just changed it's, uh, so much. A couple of times, you know, recently I've been, you know, quasi around that, and it's just like this isn't fun anymore. This isn't like I don't want to be here. This is it's late at night. I want to go to bed. I don't want to be yes. over in the morning. <laughs> this music's like, really I know. loud. My ears hurt. I can't it's, talk. Like I lost like my voice because I'm trying to talk over the over the music. <laughs> at the end of the night, my throat's sore, and I'm like, this isn't fun anymore. 
I don't want to go to, the, to hang out in the cigar lounge and use a smoke a cigar, relax, quiet, sit on the couch and go to bed early. <laughs> I was going to say cigar lounge or, or like maybe I'm just a dumb redneck. But for me, it was let's just go out in the desert with the people we actually give a fuck about. There's like 10 of us. Yes. Have a bonfire and 32 pack and a couple bottles and just, you know, whatever happens, happens. You know, what happens party, in the right? desert stays in the desert. But but um. Parking lot parties the thing by you. We used to all meet up in one of the big parking lots in the neighborhood, like at you know twenty something years old, and you know usually by like around ten o'clock, everyone would show up. A lot of times people would have date night, and they drop their girlfriend off, and they'd all the guys would go meet up in the parking lot. We'd bullshit till one, two o'clock in the morning, drink beers, hang out, and it was one Fair party. Now we got fruits. Yeah. now we got Netflix. Yeah, now no one goes out. And has fun anymore. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we should go drag <laughs> racing. It's Samuel and drag yeah. racing. Drag racing at two o'clock in the morning. No, Sam, you know, I think they're still running it right now. Um, there's a like an immersive Van Gogh exhibit down there. If your buddies are out partying, partying, it's pretty cool. Uh, it's pretty my, cool. I, I'm with I'm with I'm with Tex, who's 47 and, and he likes his beer, but he, he likes his quiet. And I'm with Kyle and I told Kyle, hey, no leash on you, mate. You go where you want. Just you show up on time for tomorrow. So um, knowing Kyle, he'll probably go get some edibles and play video games all night long and stay up all night. And knowing Tex, he'll probably drink some beer and smoke some Marlboro Reds, and uh, he'll be in bed too by probably ten or eleven o'clock. You know, we're we're a fairly tame crew these days. Um, so life has changed. <laughs> yeah, but it's better. Yeah, um, it is better. I've I got more money nights. and, and fewer hangovers. Person. Yeah, late but nights and uh, late hangovers. Uh, it's no fun. You got to ride at dawn every morning. You can't be hungover. Well, you can. Every I mean, now and then you can. No, I, I have. It hurts. It's not worth it. <laughs> you can tell by my message if I'm hungover or not. You know, I've actually had people like, just, rough night last night. Oh, here yes. we are. Yes. It's dawn. It's dawn. The sun hurts my eyes. What's up? So. I'm tired. Why am I on this stupid bike? 154 days. I can in see a row. the comments on that thread now. Brent, why do you have blue blocker sunglasses <laughs> yeah, on? Yeah. 7 a.m. It's yeah. that's. I think we should call you Mr. Consistency. You've done it so many days in a row. Yeah, I man. like that. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, that's not even, I'm not even halfway there yet. <laughs> How many miles have you put on, Brian? It's at least 10 a day. Uh, on the weekends, I usually do 20 something, 27, Saturday, Sunday, something like that. So it's at least 10. And so we're 154 times 10 plus another, I don't know, a couple hundred on top of that. I keep burning it's through. Round up. So probably, probably about 2,000 miles. Yeah, I'd say something like that. Yeah. And I rode a little bit before that, too, before I got consistent. I did it for about a month before, but I wasn't completely consistent. And then, I actually, I think I was doing it for almost 30 days through May. And then uh, Memorial Day weekend came, and it was nasty and cold. And we wanted to drink a lot, and I just didn't feel like riding. And I didn't get up and didn't show up. And for two days, I didn't ride, and I felt like shit. And I said, you know what? That's it. We're doing this for 365. It was like one of those like mm -hmm. 75 hard moments. That's it. We're done. We're doing this. And, uh, and that's where I'm at right now. I just finished 75 actually for for the I think fourth time now. Nice. Um, that's a badass right there. Weeks ago, and then you know went on a little anniversary trip, and then I've got this, and then that, and Halloween party last night. And I feel like a donkey dick. Just yeah, you want to? You, you crave 75 hard, right? Like you want to get back yeah, on I it. I do. I, I'm like, God, I gotta. I just need to wake up and, and do it. I need to wake yeah. up, do my workout, hit those weights, yeah. lift some heavy shit, eat good. Get home from work, get the kids to bed and everything. Go do that walk in the evening. Clears my mind out. Oh, I used to love that late late night walk. Just go walk through the neighborhood. I used to do a hike into the neighborhood, eleven o'clock at night, and just forty five minutes. Just you know, listen to a podcast. Sometimes listen to nothing. Listen to the air. Isn't it crazy how yeah. how much you find yourself? Oh, yeah. Dude, right. I love walking. I remember yeah, I uh, a couple of times, buddy of mine. Oh, come, let's go to, to the bar tonight and grab a beer. I said, better yet, you're gonna come walk with me. What do you mean, a buddy of mine? Uh, I grew up with. He said, oh, let's go to the bar tonight. I said, no, I'm doing my walk. And it was snowing out. And he grew up in a neighborhood. And me and him walked the neighborhood at like 11 o'clock at night. And, oh, remember so-and-so grew up in that house? Remember Mr. Smith in that house? Remember that? You remember this? We walked through the neighborhood in the snow at, you know, for an hour. Actually, I think we walked for about an hour and a half that night just because we were just bullshitting and having a good time. And it was just like, he's like, dude, this was so much better than going to the bar. And I was like, I know, right? Like, it's clarity. Like, now we wake up in the morning. We're not hungover. We got our exercise. You know, like, we're going to drink some water when we get home. And, you know, we reminisced about growing up in the village and, and, you know, all of our friends and where they went and where they are now. And it was just a nice night. And it's like, or we just sat in a bar and drank beers and spent money and been hung over. And it's like, it just you know, changes, you know, I guess we're getting old. <laughs> That's how it is. I'm just finding I'm maybe I'm getting old, but I find 
I'm a little bit of a bitch and I got to wear my heart on my sleeve. Right. Um, I'm just an emotional human being. Yeah, yeah, and sense. when I have a bad day, I need 45 minutes to go punch dance my rage out in the fucking streets while I'm listening to, to a tray you want to walk. When I have a good day, I still can't sleep. Right. And I need 45 minutes to just go walk and just revel in the fact that life is beautiful and I am blessed and um, in a good place, you know, yeah. it's just it really such is. a centering moment to take that time. It's really, and you know what it is? It's like when you're not on 75 hard, you don't want to, you know, we're all busy. We all got a ton of shit going on. We're like, ah, oh, take 45 minutes out of my day to do nothing, you know, not nothing, but to go, you know, meditate and walk. But it's like acceptable when you're on 75 hard. It's part of what I have to do. But right. then when you're not on 75 hard, it's almost a waste of time. Like, you know what I mean? Like the mindset is like, it's justified when you're on 75 hard. Or I have to go do my, you know, I'm going to, I don't have 45 minutes, but yeah. Yeah, I'm going to go do that. it. And then when in, you're not on 75, oh, I don't have to do it. So now it's not important anymore. And you kind of let Maybe you go. just got to make it important, dude. Yeah, Maybe it's... you just got to be like, fuck it. It's important. I, I mean, the, the big thing for me was consistency with reading. I mm. attempted 75 hard twice and failed twice. Uh, the first time I got to day 47 and I tore my calf, mm. I was playing soccer and it was like filleted. I couldn't. I couldn't walk for like nearly two months. Yeah. Um, so I got back to running about four months after I got injured, got going again. And then I was doing the, 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 the plates on the legs. What's it called? The leg press at the gym. And uh, I compressed something in my spine. I was on day 28 the second time. And that was about two months to get better from. So I learned pretty quick from 75 hard. Like don't, I feel like I'm 20 still. I feel like I'm maybe 25 with with 15 years worth of experience i don't feel like this old dude that i see on the camera with the gray and all that shit so when it gets to go and i go and then you oh, just yeah, realize yeah, that, that that body stops so i will uh pick up 75 hard again i need to get that back on the list but the the reading component of it i read so um, much on 75 hard it was great you know what i, and I find i'm adhd so I have trouble reading because my mind is in a hundred different places. So I read the same page three or four times. And I know and if any you had deal with it, I'll read the same page like three or four times before I'm like, fuck, what are they trying to say here? Like, you know, cause my mind yeah. is in 10 different places when I, I used to read on a treadmill. So I'd, I'd fast walk on a treadmill, basically like just to the point where you almost have to run and I have the radio on in the background and I'd read my book and I could comprehend first page every time. It was wild. It was like, I kind of was like a mind hack for ADHD and, so I read so much on a treadmill at night before bed. Like I'd get on a treadmill before bed and I'd read for you know, a lot of times I was going more than 45 minutes because I was into the book and I'm reading it. And now I'm like, all right, let's keep going. Let me get another chapter done, you know? And, yeah. uh, but it gave me, I guess the distraction, it put me at the hyper focus and allowed me to just comprehend what I was reading. And, you know, I, I always get frustrated reading because I read the same page three times. And I'm like, fuck this. I, 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 I don't <laughs> want to do this. Like I have all these books I want to read and I start reading them and I'm just like, I got too much shit to do. Like I, this is, you know, but uh, but for some reason on seventy five hard on a treadmill, I was able to read and comprehend. So I need to get back to that because uh, I enjoyed it. I read a lot of books in that process. I, I like I like the idea of reading, but when your mind's in a hundred different places and you read the same page three times, it gets frustrating. <laughs> I think that's an awesome hack, Brian. By the way, I've never heard of that before. I I, I kind of want to try it. I don't struggle so much on on the reading side of things. But at the same time, if there's a way I can get more from it, if I'm going to do it anyways. And, like, it put me in this hyper-focus where, yeah, uh, yeah it was, uh, I mean, I was, like, living a book. And, like, you were, again, like, the moment. And I, for some reason, it, you know, the distractions actually make you focus. I don't know. It's the ADHD crazy world. That True, because sometimes, you know, when I'm out doing my walks or whatever, uh, sometimes even even lifting, I'll get through, you know, a, a walk or a lift. And it's, I've done everything. I've pushed myself hard. I've worked myself out. I'm done. But I don't my brain wasn't in a million different places. I was just utterly present. Yeah, on what was exactly. Wrong. Exactly. Yeah. So when you're so in that can, space, you can read during that space. It really, it worked great for me, man. It's like, I was like, wow, like I'm knocking out books like left and right. And I'm like, I was never, you know, it took me forever to read books because I'd read them three times in a process, you know? Mm -hmm. Right. Dude, I, I started reading on Facebook just every night, just reading a, saw, a chapter yeah, yeah. out of a book. Yeah. It, and it, it's, I'm hoping people listen, but in reality, it's for me to slow down, mm -hmm. stop what I'm doing, and read that book out loud. And what I'm doing is, as I go through the chapters, when something sticks out to me, I talk about what it is. So if, if a specific line jumps out, I'll go into, oh, well, this applies to this in the modern times because of this. Yeah. And what it's doing is, is it's keeping me accountable. It's making me read, and it's forcing me to focus and analyze the content as I'm absorbing it. 
yeah. which then helps me retain it. And sitting by myself when I read, I just read and read and read and read and read. Mm-hmm. And then all of a sudden I'm like, shit, what did I just read? I'll go yep. and like have to, fl- you just, you yep. get, you get lost into it to where 100%. you're just reading and you're not absorbing the information. Yep. Yep. So for me, putting it out to an audience and you know, the, I'll get, five people or 10 people watch it. It's not many, but it's just enough to keep me accountable. So I'm accountable to the audience, which makes me read every night, which then makes me try to explain the stuff in the book from a teaching point of view, which then makes me retain the information. That's my ride of dawn. You know, I I freaking love it, dude. I get up every morning and ride because everyone's looking for me. I I literally get, text hey where are you How, where, you know you okay mm-hmm. everybody okay so i know every i get those I get when the coffee's run. missing yeah so i get those right yeah. and then i have to i do my message which makes me i have to learn something every morning i have to listen to a podcast i have to get in my head i have to really dig and deep and think about stuff and now i got people calling me out saying i'm not going deep enough on my messages i need they want deeper and i said all right well we're gonna have to start digging in a little deeper now and, uh, Just send them the fucking PayPal link. Yeah, like, hey, yeah. Yeah. Patreon. No, but you know what? There's a couple There's people that are that are um, that that are reaching out, and we're talking a lot. And the messages are are, are creating this conversation behind the scenes, which is awesome because I'm getting deep with some people about their lives and their struggles and how it relates to my struggles and all of our struggles and how to get the message out to let everyone know that we're not alone in our struggles. And you know, we're all on the same journey. We've we've realized that ourselves. You know, me and Sam, I think are twins that separated at birth and half the stuff we've been through um and you're right there with us with cars and everything else in your background i mean we're all we're all the same when you really stop and think about it so when we're dealing with something we think we're all alone in this struggle and then you realize that everybody has this problem and they all got through it and they're all winning now after they got over the other side of the apex and uh you know it's uh it's kind of soothing for people to realize that you know there is there is hope there is uh there is overcoming situations. There is, you know, we were all fat. We were all drunk and all these, you know, people were in jail, all this stuff that's going on and people recover and they have a chance to win. And, you know, it's, it's not doom and gloom. It's, you know, I, I talk about every problem in your life is, should be looked at as a lesson, not as a, as a heartache. It shouldn't be why me. It should be like, what is God trying to teach me from this? And right. if you look at everything that happens, that show, everything that shows up in your life that you think is bad, say, hey, wait a minute, what's this trying to teach me? And when you spin it like that, you go, you know what? You're right. I shouldn't have done this, or I should do this better next time, or I shouldn't have went here, or I should have did this. And you start looking at your problems as lessons. It changes the whole mindset of it. It really, really wakes you up. You know, it really is like, wow. You know what? Rather than saying, "Poor me. Why is this happening to me? You know, this sucks." You go. You know what? Wow. This this you know this taught me this. Like you know, next time right. I'm going to do this instead, or I'm going to intentionally do this to overcome this next time rather than, you know, a lot of times we let life happen. We don't live life. We let life live us. I talk about that a lot. You know, a lot of times we're just going through the motions and we're letting life kick us left and kick us right and kick us back. And, you know, and, and we're not stopping and kicking life back. We're just letting life kick us, you know, and, uh, it's, uh, there we go. His earbuds are falling out. Got you. you both said a couple things and, um, kind of going back to that little conversation we were having on like the benevolence is gone right mm-hmm. from corporate America and it's gone from a lot of things but but so in my career right I've been pretty fortunate been able to make quite a bit of money you know I got into into insurance and finance and inside of two years as this little piece of shit redneck kid from southwest U.S. with with a little life insurance license I'm making more than the corporate CEOs who who you know went to school and they're running this multi-billion dollar company it's kind of cool but that shit doesn't fulfill me, right? What's really fulfilling to me is is some mess. Like now, I coach agents. I, I help people build a career. We take them from the depths of despair to to you know heights they didn't they didn't realize they could have a, a fifty thousand dollar income in ninety days. They a hundred thousand dollars. They didn't realize they could do a million dollars. But um, it's it's super fulfilling for me. I get texts and and, and messages every day, and I know both of you do as well because yeah. I watch your content. Every day where people are like, my God, thank you for talking about this. Thank you for yeah, talking about it, that. It's, and, I mean, it's um, amazing when, when people jump in your DMs and they're just like, thank you. I needed that today. You know, I, I appreciate that. Like, you know, I'm struggling with that. I'm so glad you talked about it. I mean, it's just me and Sam share a lot of stuff back and forth comments. And it's it's like, dude, yeah. this is this is why we're doing this. Fuck the money. Who cares about the money, honestly? But it's <laughs> isn't is it fun. like just so just it, it does something for your soul to bring some benevolence oh, back to this. It's... And you both said something, Sam. You talked about how you get it so much more and it's so much more impactful when you're coming at it from how how am I gonna teach this? And then Brian, you talked about how you and I, before we started 
we went live here, we were even talking about how I just run out of shit to say sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. Right. But when you're constantly putting that that drip in reading those books, listening yeah. to those podcasts and whatever, and instead of how am I going to help me? It's how am I going to help them? Like Sam was talking about, you know, coming from this. What am I going to teach today? How am I going to create some fucking impact? I call it making a cake. I take what you're going to say tonight. I take what Sam's going to say. I take what Ryan says tomorrow morning. I take it all. We put all the ingredients together. We mix it up. I put my my opinion on it, and I, I put it back adds out a, there. Adds a little nuttiness. You know, yeah, you just um, add a couple of nuts. It's a bit natty. Yeah, <laughs> nutty. Um, I know you know what I'm talking about. It's, but isn't it yeah, the most it, beautiful it is shit thing ever to just bring some benevolence back oh, to this thing? Awesome. It fucking is. And and the the crazy thing is, the more I give, the happier I am, and the more people give to me. And the, oh. You know... It's given to the universe. <sighs> I talk about that all the time. We don't give to one person specifically. Every, everything it's not we all, do, it, you give into the universe, and the universe gives back to you. So that person it's not may not be able to help you. you know, but like I said, a lot of times like people look at, oh, that person can't help me because of whatever the position. Maybe they're the janitor, right? So I don't want, I'm not going to help the janitor because he can't help me back. You know what? Help the janitor. He, he'll probably never be able to help you back, but the universe knows that you helped the janitor. And when someone else needs your help, they're going to come back to you. It's all a big circle. So you keep feeding energy into the universe. And uh, we talked about this with Stacy. Um, it's not a one for one thing. And then we talk about just our referrals. Like Ryan says 10 to one, right? We got to give out 10 times to get one back. So those 10 times we're given out, we're given to the universe and the universe is sending us one back. And it's, it's yeah, but I actually get joy from giving. I get yeah. joy from it. I experience, that's where I find my happiness, like is from helping other people. Well, look at the comeback, um, look at the giving. It, you know, it, it, <coughs> it got a bit heavy for me the first time, uh, the other day I had a, I had a guy call me like he hit me up on messenger at like fucking stupid o'clock in the morning and um he said because of what you went through i know you can help pull me what through what i'm going through and he was drunk and in tears at fucking seven in the morning think he was going to kill himself and i was on a phone for about 45 45 fucking minutes with this guy and like I didn't ask for that shit. That threw me into something that I'd never even fucking thought about before. Like, but is there some kind of longer term role for me in substance abuse mm. and those kind of groups? Cause that was like a fucking, that was a huge wake up. You have no idea who's listening. Like oh. I, I know this guy, but I haven't seen him in, in years. He was one of the old like knock around guys from the bar from years ago. But he's hitting me up because he's like, you've been through it. You've been through what I'm going through. I'm, I'm, there's no way out for me. What the fuck do I do? And man, I don't know where I was going with that. I just want to get it off my chest because that's been no. sitting real fucking heavy since he called me. And like, you know, maybe, maybe I need to go get some help from a counselor and figure out, you know, what to do. And because like, we're out here going, hey, life's fucking great. It's brilliant. It was shit when we were fat and alcoholic and when we were, out, you know, out of control. But now it's great. And then, but the people that are hearing the message are reaching to us going, well, how do I take control? Yeah, yeah. That's a, that's a difficult question to answer because most people's heads aren't where they need to, they haven't broken yet. Dude, the I only think reason I got, what's it's, that? It's winning, man. It's, you, you just yeah. got to start winning, right? That's how, that's yeah. where control comes from. Mm-hmm. Is right. winning. And sometimes the task you gotta, you gotta accomplish is so fucking massive. It's so overwhelming. You stare at it like it's a brick wall you got to run through. Yes. And that's and what it is. But I'm here to tell you, you can run through any fucking brick wall. You just got to get a run at the brick wall. You're not going to lean against it yeah. and expect that shit to fall over. You remember yeah. Wiley Coyote back in the day wanting to push this big ass boulder off a cliff and, and kill that little fucking birdie, <laughs> like kill Roadrunner. And, you know, he'd push and push and push and it would never work. And then he'd get a run from like across the county. And across the county, he'd get there and like, yeah. hit that boulder, and it goes tumbling yeah. down the hill. But that's life. you got to accumulate wins. It's one of the things I, momentum. I I teach is like we've got these five stewardships in our lives. And I call them a stewardship because it's shit you're responsible for. It's not just shit that exists. You are responsible for it in order to have a, a level of fulfillment and happiness, right? You've got your physical body, your relationship with your mental self your spiritual self, your family, and your work. And that can be family of choice or, or whatever, right? But you have these five areas and everything falls into there. And any one of them that gets neglected becomes a sore thumb and you just stare at the wall. 
Mm-hmm. But when you can't get a win, when you can't, when you've got, I've got to make $100,000. I've got to do this. I've got to do that. I've got to pay this hospital bill. I'm going into bankruptcy. That's something insurmountable. But how do you overcome the insurmountable? It's by getting a run at the fucking rock. Yeah. How do you get yeah. a run at the walk, rock? You go get a win in any of those areas. I've got to make $100,000. I don't know where to start. What if I just do five push-ups first and I feel better about myself? What if I pick up a book and read 10 pages today? What if I go do that 45-minute walk? What if I kiss my wife on the way out the door instead of being an asshole because I'm in my own head about some shit, right? Mm -hmm. You just get a win, and you build momentum. And that momentum is what crushes some shit. Without it, like it is – it's the only thing you – it's the only thing you have in your arsenal is momentum. So we go all the way back to like we're talking about control, control, control. We should want control. I get why these motherfuckers want control yeah, yeah. over billions and trillions of dollars. We should want control for ourselves. Yeah, yeah. And the way to control your day is, is taking advantage of the fact that you were given an able body and a, a capable mind, a willing like spirit. We, gotta Go get in, we get intentional, right? We get intentional with what we're doing. We get intentional. Like you said, you intentionally kiss your wife goodbye on the way out the door rather than be in your head and, and let life live you. You live in your life. You're... you're intentionally making that phone call you're intentionally going to the gym you're intentionally eating the right thing you know rather than just existing and just a hamster in the wheel that we all talk about all the time you know right. and you build that momentum of those wins and you know once that momentum is going it's hard to stop I, I do it in real estate a lot and sam we probably the same thing i get a deal coming together and sometimes there's problems in the deal and i said let's just keep pushing it once the momentum goes it'll go like what about mm-hmm. this there's a title issue don't worry once it's in contract once it start moving It'll fix itself. It'll come through. Like, oh no, we gotta wait. There's a there's an issue with the building department. Don't worry. Get it in contract. We'll deal with the issue. Once the momentum's going, once that boulder's rolling, we're not stopping it. If we stop now and try and deal with it, the deal's gonna fall apart. It's not gonna happen. So I tell them, come on, just keep pushing. Let's get this deal done. Let's get this in contract. Let's get it moving. Let's get the title search going. And let's get everything part, happening. And then momentum. Part goes. of what we do, part of what we do as real estate agents is is hide that shit from the clients. <laughs> like they should never know just how much shit has hit their oh. particular fan on any given day. Um, you know, we that's the problem. We make it look easy, and no one wants to pay us for it. And it we show them what we actually yes, do behind the scenes. There's a lot of behind the scenes movement between between contracting and closing. There's a, yeah, there's a oh, lot. I, my owner, I can do this myself, and then they deal with uh, you know all the stuff that we deal with on a regular basis. And uh, you know, we make it look easy because we don't talk about that stuff. But if you really, we really should do a documentary on what the crap we got to do to make a house close. You know, who gets cold feet? Who backs out? Who Who's got a phony yeah. pre-approval? Who's got an attorney that wants to blow I, the deal up? Who's got a building department that's got violations? I mean, I'd, I'd tell you about the, I'd tell you about the last deal I closed, but I, it would be horrendously off topic and it would take far too long. But I will tell you in private, Brian, it was, it was quite the deal. You just keep moving forward though, right? I've got this agent I coach and first time I talked to him, calls me, just got into insurance, dropped on his fucking face like all of us are, by the way. And um, he's, I mean, put it all on the line, his savings and everything. And his wife has basically told him, look, it's, it's me or this business you bought. And not because she's some bitch and fuck her. That's not what I'm saying. Financial stress is, it's a real thing. It's a real Dude, that happened to my that happened to my buddy. He bought an insurance agency and eight months and it was under and he's back. Uh, it's been about a year now and he's, he's back working a regular job. Right. So oh, he yeah. came to me with this problem, this insurmountable wall, right, of my wife's leaving me over insurance. And I was oh, like, well, well, the problem isn't your wife's leaving you over insurance. It's she's leaving you over some financial instability. You need some financial instability. How do we get it? And so we break it all the way down. It's like, okay, you need to get business. He actually comes from the auto industry too. And it's like, okay, I'm going to give you some scripts I used. You're going to walk into auto shops and get quotes. He's like, well, how do I do that? Because to me right now, I'm so down in my own shit. Walking into an auto shop to ask mechanics for quotes is an insurmountable task. It's the rock on the cliff. It's the brick wall, right? And so it's like, okay, bro, you've got to get some freaking wins. So you're going to pull up, you're going to get out of your car. And before you walk in there, he's a big, you know, kind of fitness buff. And I'm like, do 10 pushups, do 10 pushups and then walk your ass in there before you have a chance to catch your breath. And he started doing that. And all of a sudden shit starts popping off for him. All of a sudden he's like, Hey, I've got two weeks. I got to make five grand in commission. I'm like, you can do it. Here's what you need to do on a daily basis. Just keep doing push-ups before you confidence. do anything with insurance. Go yeah. do push-ups. Momentum and right? confidence. Every, every deal you get more confident. Every deal you get more two, confident. Exactly. Two weeks he made five grand in commission, which 
It's, is it life-changing money to a billionaire? No. Is it life-changing money to somebody who hasn't made anything? Yeah. And I'm yeah, here to yeah. tell you at five grand in two weeks, that's 10 grand a month is 120 a year. Motherfucker, you got a career. Mm-hmm. You want to build on it? Yeah, but you've got a career. You just did it. And after that first month of confidence, he walks in these places without even doing push-ups and says, I own this because I can do it and I've proven myself. The real estate's the same thing. But it, it's all in, it's, it's all, all right there. there. It's, it's all, all right there. there. All of it. My yeah. agents, every agent that I on my team that I coach, once they get their first deal done, it's like they open the faucet. They struggle and struggle. Yeah, but you struggle, have to. They get their first deal, and once that first deal happens, all of a sudden it's like the faucet opens because they get the confidence. Yeah, but you just they, nailed. You just nailed why though. You just nailed why because I'm going into my first deal with ignorance, yeah. and I'm replacing that ignorance with experience, and the experience just breeds the confidence. Yeah. So yeah, you know, I, I get it. That imposter like, syndrome as I'm a new real estate agent. I can't do this. I can't get this listing. I can't sell this house. And you doubt yourself, and then you get in there and be like, well, I can do this. you know. And then, mm-hmm. obviously, if you have someone good to lean on, you're on a team, you have someone to push you through it. So when you have someone, you know, something goes sideways, you have that person to lean on, you say, I can do this. And if I can't, I have the support of my team to push me through this, you know. And uh, and then, then one deal happens, two deal happens. Well, what they don't understand is you never know all the answers to everything. No. Like, I, I have other experienced agents okay. that lean on me. Uh, I lean back on them. Shit. One of my attorneys called me the other day about a contract law right. problem. And I told her the answer to it. I'm like, is, is Google broke? She's like, well, I thought that was the answer, yeah. but I wanted to check. And, and But having like yeah. going into the very first deal, yeah. thinking you're on your own, I don't know about, I can see why yeah. a lot of people fail at real estate. that They don't have that confidence, but the confidence comes from experience and it comes from having the, that network. The team is important. I, I think in real estate, oh, yeah. a new agent should be part of a team. With a, with a team leader I, that, that coaches them and you know you're doing the same thing you're putting a team together i got a team of about a dozen agents and yeah. you have that person that i may not know the answers but i know who to call you know i have exactly quality. you know i know a good amount of them because i've learned the hard lessons and i've you know, I made the phone calls already but you know they lean on me and if i don't know right away i make the call and i say hey what do you think hey listen we were talking friday night was that about nine o'clock <laughs> friday night we were talking about uh exp stuff um mm-hmm. you know leaning on each other because we know listen I don't have the answer. You don't have the answer. Let's figure it out. You know, yeah, we, um, and we did. We got to figure it out. Here's a question right. for you guys. Yes. You real estate, insurance, finance, most, most uh, of these businesses, uh, especially sales, heavy on recruiting, super heavy on recruiting. Mm-hmm. And in this post COVID environment or current COVID environment or whatever the hell you want to call it, right? A lot of people are turning to those types of careers. There are lots of people that get recruited into companies who don't give a shit. So you talk about having a team. It's easy to get recruited to a team, but to have a team that gives a shit enough to be benevolent enough to, you know, Brian, you know who to call Mm -hmm. with this problem. I may not know the answer, but I know who you should call. Right. But you actually took your agent's call first to tell them who they need to reach out to. So for all these people that are, are looking into how do I scrape together some extra income, I'm being recruited to a team. How do I tell the difference? Between a bullshit team that's a whole bunch of rah rah drinking the Kool Aid, but it's not going to do anything for me, or finding a team that has that benevolence where they're going to take the phone call, they're going to tell you where to get the access information. How do you tell the difference? Um, I think for, first is knowing that the team leader produces and actually knows the business. I mean, because there's a lot of teams out there where the, the team leader, like you know, in real estate, the team leader doesn't sell real estate anymore, or it doesn't, you know. You know, I sell a lot of houses myself. Like, you know, I did a team because a lot of people wanted to get into real estate. And I said, hey, why don't you join my team? I'll teach you how to do this. And I I, be, I started a team by accident. I didn't, really didn't have an intention to start a team. And then I realized that, you know what? I hate doing open houses on the weekend because I want to go hang out with the kids and go do things and, you know, go away and go to the beach and do whatever. So all summer long when I'm sitting at open house Saturday and Sunday, I'm like, that's one of the reasons I never want to do real estate in the beginning. Like, I don't want to sit at open house yeah. on the weekend. Like, I, I, my weekends are valuable. I don't want to do that. Yeah. So when I started yeah. a team, now my team does the open houses. They get buyer leads out of it. Buyers come in and they say, hey, listen, I don't like this house, but I like to buy a house in the area. We build a relationship there and we go show them houses. And that's how we, you know, that's how we get lead generation, you know, from, yeah. from real, yeah. like proven leads. And um, so the team actually fit that that mark for me where it freed up my weekends. Usually I'll do the first open house, but if it goes more than the first open house, second, third, fourth, and these days it goes on the first open house, but years ago before it didn't, you know, we do open houses every weekend for a month until it's sold. And I'd put my team there Saturday, Sunday, Saturday, Sunday, which makes me more valuable. I tell people when you're going to hire an agent, hire a team because you're not just hiring me, you're hiring a dozen of us for the same price. 
doesn't cost yeah. you anymore. We got we'll twelve people, twelve social networks, twelve people that can do open houses, twelve people that can show your house, twelve people that can give you ideas. Um, you know, versus a solo agent that's got one person and they may have four open houses that week and they can only do an open house for two hours. I can do an open house for four hours a day all weekend long because I got depth of the team, mm -hmm. and um, it really makes a difference. I find in you know in, in just the whole package. It's a, team concept's not something new, but I guess in a way it is newer. I mean. Well, I, I, I tried a team a couple of years ago and I was completely miserable. Um, I didn't like running the the team side of it and <clears throat> corralling real estate agents uh, and getting a bunch of 1099 guys to do shit when they didn't want to do it was, was, it was yeah, quite challenging. Know, so my team is, if you want to do it, great. If you don't want to do it, great. I have agents that haven't sold that, anything with me and I have agents that have where, sold dozens of houses. Like, And it's like, listen, you know, I could bring you to the water, I, but I can't make you drink, so... I have a team meeting well, weekly and, you know, the people that produce show up at the meetings and the people that don't produce don't show up in the meetings. The math is yeah. there. You haven't sold any houses and you're struggling, yet you can't bother showing up for the weekly meeting. And I have guest speakers yeah. in and I have all this other stuff goes on and it's like, just like everyone else, who wants to do the work? You know, how bad do you uh, want it? Yeah. No, that's, that, that's where you're at. I mean, I'm building a team now um, purely because people on the team saw what I'm doing and came and asked. I, that was my. Like, they, they came. They came I'm to me and said, "I want to." I, I don't bring people onto my team. They come to me. You know. Right, and it, it's going back to the likable, attractive character they teach in Apex and putting yeah. out good shit into the world, and people being attracted to that, saying, "I want to be a part of it," and that has caused me to reconsider. Um, actually, because like with EXP, there's different ways to do it. You can have a team that you never speak to. You just sign That's people you, up. Sit down, line your sponsors. Yeah, or I, you get that team. Wanna, I never wanted to mess with that. Um, I found that quite a, a turn off to the model. Um, the minute anybody mentioned the XP, it was all about, oh, you should be in my downline. I'm like, well, that's not, I, I, I get it. It's a huge revenue source for a lot of people. It just never really appealed to me. And um, now that people are starting to come and say, hey, look, I see what you're doing. I want to be a part of what you're building. That's a whole different person that's coming to me for mentoring and for training than me going out and trying to recruit yeah. realtors to come and work for me. 100%. You see the, the, the difference there, um, the makeup, where it's more of a mentoring relationship and they, they will pay attention. Yeah. They, they will and if do they the don't, work. like, I don't, listen, you know what? I got people that don't show up in meetings that don't sell and, you know, listen, uh, you don't have any leads. Go do an open house for me this weekend. Oh, I'm busy. All right. How about and, next and, Sunday? Oh, I'm busy then too. All right. I guess you really don't want this, you know, and that doesn't bother me. Listen, you know, it doesn't cost me well, anything for them to be on my team. I, I think it's annoying that they're wasting this opportunity. But if they want to, don't want to do yeah. it, and they don't want to put in the work. It doesn't bother me. Like, whatever. Like here I am. I'm teaching you how to do it. I'm giving you all my secrets. I'm telling you this is what I do, and this is how it works. Just do what I do. And sometimes they want to reinvent the wheel, and sometimes they want to come up with all new stuff. And I'm like, why would you do that? This is what I'm doing. This is what works. And just follow what I do. And the ones that do, you know, they they excel. And the ones that don't, you know, they don't. And you know, you can lead the horse to water, but you can't make them drink, you know? So I just think of it like that. And yeah, the team the doesn't, truth. you know, it doesn't frustrate me. Like I said, because so I know it's sometimes you bring your teams in and you treat them more like every person has to produce. But if, if I don't have any overhead on that person, they don't sell any houses. Like who cares? Who cares? Maybe if they sell one house a year, eventually they will. Great. But, um, yeah. So, <laughs> um, He's saying take pictures, so I'll pose too. I was taking pictures. And taking pictures, yeah. Okay. Um, pretty. All right, we're going crazy overtime here. I need I need one more picture here in a minute. <laughs> Everyone smile. Um, just I'm I feel like I feel like an old man trying to use fucking technology these days. All right, everybody smile. All right, there we go. All right, it's time to get out of here. Yeah. Um, we oh, like an shit. hour and a half now. Oh, Carson, you... that was well fun, mate. Oh, we my didn't battery's going dead. About... Ooh, I'm good. Thank you for having me on. It's the only way to shut him up. <laughs> yeah, my battery's going to die. Pull his battery. Yeah. All right. Um, any closing thoughts, Brian? You want to invite people to next week's show? Uh, yeah, yeah, next week. Uh, get some fire live, 8.30 Eastern. And um, do we confirm our guest next 5 week? 5.30 Vegas time, right? There you go. Yeah. Or whatever time this was. 8.30 Shit, Eastern. Shit, we've been a minute. Yeah, we've been on like an hour All right. and a half. It's fun. Time flies when you're having fun. All right, so. well, we got I'm live this week. Here. We'll see you at live. Looking forward to it. Carson, yeah, Apex Live, Friday. You going to yes. be there, Carson? 
I will not be there. So. Uh, Quitter. Quitter. FYE. All right. I'm going to get out of here. Um, it, I'm going to be stuff. reading from The Richest Man in Babylon here in just a little bit. So I'll see some of you guys soon. Custom mate, going. I'll see you soon. Good stuff. Thank you for joining Thanks us, man. Much. We'll see you. Take care, the same. Put your head on a pillow every night knowing you made the world a better place. Fire starts fire. Let's go. Do it. All right, everyone. Later, guys. All right, later.